Return now in your imagination to England as it was 200 years ago. It was an England much different from that which we are accustomed to today. It was an England of quiet villages, of farms and small holdings, of vast unenclosed pasturage and masses of woodland. In many areas there had been little change since the Middle Ages. By far the greater portion of the population was engaged in farming or other rural occupations, but the standard of living was low. The farms were small and the methods of cultivation very primitive. The rotation of crops was only imperfectly understood, as were other practices which would have increased food production. As for the sheep, there was little for them to eat during the winter, except what God Almighty sent for them, and they mostly died off. Let us turn now to the conditions of manufacturing, specifically to the conditions in the textile industries. Wool, in those days, was the great pillar of English prosperity. A spinning wheel was to be found in every cottage and farmhouse in the kingdom, and a loom in every village. This method of manufacture was called the domestic system. Timothy! Hi, Master. Come, lad. You carry on. That's a good lad. What I mean by the domestic system is the little masters living in villages or detached houses, with all their comforts, carrying on business with their own capital. Such a master worked with his own hands, and nearly all the processes through which the wool was put were carried out in his own house. Besides his loom, the master weaver would have his farm, of three to fifteen acres in size, rights of grazing for his pigs and poultry, and sometimes a cow, a barrel of home-brewed ale, a workday suit, and another for Sundays. Both the apprentices and the journeymen were lodged and boarded in the master's house. See, that keeps steady beat, lad. I'm trying, master, I'm trying. I'm trying right. right. to see that, lad. <laughs> Masters and men were in general so joined together in sentiment that they did not wish to be separated if they could help it. The masters considering it their duty to keep their men on, even when times were slack. Thus a workman would live and die on the spot where he was born. The master and his family used few things which were not the work of their own hands. What think thee? Eee, it looks champion, doesn't it? It'll make grand coat for lad. Hi, <laughs> you're a lucky little boy. Off with thee. Eee, wife. Eee, goodness me. They grew on their own land the corn with which they were fed. Spun in their own home the wool with which they were clothed. Supplied the rest of their wants by the sale of woolen cloth which they manufactured. Be present at table, Lord. Be here and everywhere adored. Thy creatures bless and grant that we may feast in paradise with thee. Amen. The master used to sit at the end of all table along with his family and his men say grace to them, and cut up meat and pudding. He might take a cup of strong beer to his cell, when his men had none, but that was pretty nearly all difference in manner of living. That be for Rob. Aye. Pass it down, lass. There's much for thee to learn in weaving as yet. But the pay is little enough for the learning of it. Money's a bad thing in young pockets. But there was, it is true, an extremely dark side to this picture. Yeah, there were, for instance, 
Acts of Parliament against a working man striking to raise his wages. There was a strike last winter, but it was put on to in the usual way, with the constable staff, the baronet, and the jail. The laboring man hardly dared to strike, and he could not go elsewhere for another job. He earned precious little money over his entire lifetime. He occupied a position halfway between slave and free man, or more accurately, between serf and citizen. Such then, briefly and imperfectly described, were the conditions in the textile industries 200 years ago in England. These conditions varied from place to place and from time to time. England was by no means a garden of Eden, but life did move on from generation to generation in its quiet course. And then, within the next 100 years, the nation was transformed. <coughs> It was, in truth, a complete transformation in the English way of life. Villages became towns. Towns became cities. And manufacturing was transferred from quiet homesteads to factories. This transformation we call the Industrial Revolution. We may say, without danger of oversimplification, that three inventions destroyed our old world and built a new one. The first was the spinning jenny. The second, the power loom. The third, the steam engine. The spinning jenny, the power loom, the steam engine. Three machines, which together with countless other machines, or to transform man's world. As far back as history goes, man has been making and using tools. A tool does little work. The worker's muscles must supply the power, his brains the skill. <coughs> centuries and centuries of tool making and tool using. And then, in the year 1765, less than 200 years ago... A Jenny! A Jenny, I say! James Hargreaves had invented a hand-worked machine, which he named after his wife. He called it the Spinning Jenny. The Spinning Jenny was to initiate a revolution in the woolen industry of England. Spinning had always been a slow process. Only one thread could be spun at a time. But James Hargreaves mounted eight spindles on a frame and turned them all with one wheel, thus spinning eight threads at once. But Hargreaves' ingenuity soon got him into trouble. spinners were afraid that the spinning jenny would spin them out of work. But he did not stop experimenting and soon had another jenny which could spin 16 threads at once. A child by turning a wheel could do the work which had formerly been done by more than a hundred spinners. And now no amount of opposition could change the course of history. For one invention was to lead to another. In 1784, the people of Gobi Marwood, a tiny village in the English Midlands, had cause to be disturbed. There were curious goings on indeed in the cottage of their minister, the Reverend Edmund Cartwright. It's witchcraft! The 
The Reverend Cartwright, his neighbors charged, was not a good man. He was practicing witchcraft. But their fears were unfounded. Cartwright had merely invented a machine, but one which was a great stride forward. For now the power came not from the workers' muscles, as with the spinning jenny, but from another source, water. The energy in flowing water had been harnessed to turn a machine for weaving cloth. A power loom. Hand labor in the manufacture of cloth was doomed, as was something more. The old domestic system of manufacturing. Thus, the invention of the power loom speeded tremendously the growth of the factory system. Now, instead of working in his own cottage, the weaver lived in one place and worked in another. As commonplace as this seems today, there was bitter opposition to the tyranny of the factory bell. Time was when I could throw down my shuttle whenever I liked. But it was still another invention, which was to give the Industrial Revolution its greatest impulse. James Watt, how often have I told you not to waste your time? You'll come to no good, laddie. I'm no wasting my time, Mother. I am inventing something. <laughs> inventing something? What are you inventing, laddie? I'm no quite sure, but I believe it's a, a steam engine. The legend of young James Watt and his mother's tea kettle is, of course, untrue. The first steam engine was, in fact, invented by Thomas Newcomen in 1705 and was used to pump water out of coal mines. But one of Newcomen's steam engines was brought to Watt's work here. He had so improved the steam engine that it was a cheap source of great power and could be used to drive all types of machines. Now, with Watt's invention and with improved methods of making iron and steel, the Industrial Revolution was an accomplished fact. The spinning wheel and the loom were silenced. Vast cities sprang up, not overnight, but within the short space of less than a hundred years. And in the place of the master weaver, half manufacturer, half farmer, came the capitalist employer, the owner of scores of looms, the employer of hundreds of men. With the Industrial Revolution, England in the 19th century became the workshop of the world. The times called for imagination. And together, the businessmen and the engineers created an age in which supreme in work. Consequently, futures reacted at the outset and... Profits shown are £134,000, which is, we think, a very satisfactory... There seemed to be ample cause for great optimism. England had entered upon an era of great national prosperity. To be an Englishman in the early 19th century was to have at call every comfort, every pleasure the world could provide, if you were well-to-do. But what of the great masses of people? Large numbers of them sank deeper and deeper into destitution and misery. There may be seen at any time of the day women dipping household water from a foul fitted ditch 
its banks coated with a compound of mud and filth. The life of the average English worker, and this term in those days included women and children of tender age, was a miserable struggle for existence in which there were two enemies, the employer and the machine. Yes, sir. I begun working in the mill when I was seven, sir. The hours is from five morning till eight o'clock at night. Talk of serfs. Did feudal times ever see any of them so debased, so absolutely slaves, as the poor workers of the enlightened North? While the men of the Colming legions are employed in digging in the mines with pickaxes and shovels, women, and even children, have the task of dragging the coal from the extremity of the mines along the underground roads. The belt and the chain is worse when we're in the family way. It's no uncommon thing for women to drop their burden and fall off the ladder. The truth was that England's new wealth and her world supremacy in trade rested on foundations of harsh, sweated labor, appalling slum conditions, and immense human misery. Was this the new civilization promised by the machine? I see, and I see it with pleasure, that the working people of England know that they are ill-used and that they cordially hate those who ill-treat them. There is a difference now in the very behavior of our laboring men. Some hardly address you with ordinary civility. All schemes of reform are far too late to prevent the tremendous evils which I have long seen gathering around us. My, did I not hire them fairly in the... Have I not paid this to the last sixpence? England, said Dr. Arnold, was engulfed. It must inevitably face a bloodbath of political revolution. In spite of many local disturbances and riots, the revolution, so long expected and so long feared, did not come to England, as it had earlier to France. There were two principal reasons. The first was reform. There had been for years strong agitation for reform of the worst evils caused by the Industrial Revolution. And in 1842, Parliament passed the first of a long series of reforms, the Mines Act. Resolved that henceforth the underground employment in coal mines of women and children under the age of 10 is hereby prohibited. In 1847, the Ten Hours Act. Resolved that henceforth the work of women and children in textile factories shall be limited to a period of not more than ten hours in any one day. And by 1875, trade unions, hitherto restricted in their bargaining powers by law, full legal protection. Industrial revolution did not result in England in a political revolution, was, in a word, productivity. In the days of hand labor, before the coming of machines, it took one man something like 18 hours to make one shoe. One man, a skilled craftsman, performed all the operations. The craftsman, at the end of his labors, often had a great sense of accomplishment. 
But to make a bare living, he had to work extremely hard. For his productivity was low, necessarily low, since he could perform only one operation at a time. And though the workmanship might be first class, the price of the finished shoes was bound to be high. Few people could afford them. But with the coming of the machine, the productivity of each workman was enormously increased. From the preparation of the hides to the finished shoe, there is a division. Each man performs only one operation. All day, over and over again, he does one job. A finished shoe, once the leather is prepared, can be manufactured in less than 20 minutes instead of the 18 hours of the old handicraft method. Thus, each man produces more. His productivity, thanks to the machine, is higher. Hours of work throughout the industry are shorter. The pay higher and prices lower. The worker can buy his own product. More people can share in the growing wealth of the nation. This was the promise of the machine and of the Industrial Revolution. A promise, it is true, which has still to be realized to its fullest extent. But nevertheless, a promise of material plenty for all. The 19th century, the century of the Industrial Revolution, was for England a century of great achievement. An agricultural country with one great industry, the woolen, was transformed into a nation of engineers, of coal mines, of steel mills, of factories. It was a transformation which was not achieved without hardship. But within a short space of time, as the man reckoned, England became the shop of the market. And, perhaps more important, besides exporting her locomotives, her steam engines, her textiles, and other finished products, England, industrialism itself. From this tiny island off the coast of Europe, the Industrial Revolution spread. And with it, the great problems and the great material benefits of modern industrial civilization.